welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. You guys ready to get into the word of the Lord tonight? Well, I sure, I sure am. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go before the Lord. I'm going to get down on my knees in prayer. If you would join me, if you're able to stand, let's honor the Lord in reverence and prayer. Father God, we come before you today, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a band or to be entertained. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would speak to us tonight, to minister to us, to bring things to our remembrance. To, to, to take the word that we hear tonight, Father, and to drop it into our hearts to like a seed sown on good ground that we could walk out of this place and bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. Lord, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So, Father, I thank you that you would set your hand upon all the churches in the Inland Empire and all across the world that are teaching and preaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ today. Lord, we thank you that we are brothers and sisters and co-laborers in the body of Christ. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for all that you will accomplish in your body in Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. All right, well, praise God. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Mark. Turn with me to the book of Mark. I'll tell you what, God is good, the devil's a liar, a little punk. You know, we're talking about the title of this, this, this afternoon or this evening's message is called Word of Mouth, we're talking about the Word of God and speaking the word of God over our lives. And don't you know that the, that punk devil tries to give me a sinus infection to shut me up from talking to you about speaking the word of God? I'll tell you what, I'm going let no punk devil stop me from preaching the word of God. So if you would endure my raspiness, if I sound like a prepubescent young male, excuse me, my, my throat and my sinuses have... I've had a rough couple of days, but praise God, I am healed in the name of Jesus. I'm excited about it. So the title of tonight's message is called Word of Mouth. I want to talk to you about the word of the Lord, about what comes out of our mouths. Now, I had you turn to the book of Mark, but before we actually go to the book of Mark, I'm going to pop up a scripture for you. Pastor Deborah quoted it this morning in Proverbs, the 18th chapter, the 21st verse. It says this, it says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You know, we've heard countless messages about death and life being in the power of the tongue. We've heard about, you know, uh, uh, messages about how we ought to watch what we say, how we ought to not gossip. The Bible tells us to shun profane babblings and idle talk. We've heard those messages. You say, Pastor Luke, I'm new to church. I haven't heard very many of those messages. Whether or not you've even been in church or not, you've heard those messages. You've heard that it's not good to gossip. It doesn't do good to talk bad about other people, to, to say nice things. You know, I remember there's an old, old proverb that's, that's gone around. It's been around since the, the dawn of time. You know it. I know it. It goes like this. Your mother used to tell it to you as a kid. You tell it to your kids now. Your kids will tell it to their kids. It goes along something like this. If you don't have anything nice to say. Hey, see, look at that. You all knew it already. So the bottom line is, is that we know that death and life are in the power of the tongue. As a matter of fact, the, the book of James tells us much about the tongue. It refers to the tongue like a ship on a, a, a rudder on a mighty ship, how it's small but it turns a big ship, or a bridle in a horse's mouth, and goes on to tell us that we've tamed the beasts of the air and the, and the, and the beasts of the land. You know, uh, 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 there's nothing that man hasn't put their hand to, but the one thing we can't seem to tame, the one thing we can't seem to control is our tongue. I don't know about you, but there's been times where I've just said something and it's just like, man, you know, uh, it's like I just open my mouth just wide enough to pick my foot up in it and just shove it right on in there. I don't know if anybody else has ever had that foot and mouth syndrome, but I'll tell you, there's, if there's anything that's hard to control, hard to bridle, it's the tongue. As a matter of fact, I remember once long ago, Pastor Eddie, when he was our youth pastor, he's our pastor over in Coachella Valley now, he had this one message when I was in youth a long time ago about the most deadly weapon in the world, and you had this security guy come in looking with glasses and a, and a big buff guy in a suit, and he had a suitcase and a, and, a, and a handcuff to his suitcase, and he came in, he's like, I got the most deadly weapon in the world, and I'm going to show it to everybody. Now all the youth are like, 
what did he bring? Is this like a nuclear launch thing? Or, you know, and he pulls it out and says, this big cow tongue out of this suitcase. The truth of the matter is, is that wars have been started over words. You've heard the term. Maybe you as a kid said it to bullies that bullied you or your kids say it. You've heard it. Sticks and stones might break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But don't you know there's not, not a more false statement in life that words go deep. When something's said, you can't go into the mind, into the heart of this person that you said it to and remove it. It's there. It's stuck. So we see that death is in the power of the tongue. We hear a lot about that. Tonight, I don't want to talk to you about death and the power of the tongue. We've heard enough about death and the power of the tongue. Read the newspaper. You can see what people say, the backbiting, the gossiping. And you can just look at them and say, that's not how people should be. But today, I want to talk to you about life in the power of the tongue. Because life and death, death and life are both in the power of the tongue. And today I want to talk to you about the Word of God and the spoken Word and speaking the Word of the Lord to you. Pastor Debbie brought an amazing message about boldness before God and things that we should know about our boldness before God and, and an effective and a bold prayer life. Talking about speaking it. And you and I as Christians are called to be bold. Called to be zealous for the things of God. Called to stand up and draw a line in the sand for what we believe and speak what the Lord tells us to speak. To say what the Bible tells us to say and to not back down when we face opposition or hard times. But in our day and age it's tough to speak the word because you become the outcast. Because you become that weirdo. You become that person, oh, man, as soon as that person opens up their mouth, I'll tell you what, I don't know. They're going to say something about that Bible. But let me tell you something. When you and I begin to speak life over ourselves, over our situations, over our family, over our friends, over our finances, over our kids, whatever it might be through the word of God, I'll tell you, that's when things start to change. And so life is in the power of the tongue. We know that death is in the power of the tongue. That's evident. So let's talk about what does speaking have to do with life? Well, in order to understand that, we need to go to the beginning. Now, I'm not going to have you turn there because actually, in my opinion, I think it's one of the hardest verses in the Bible to locate, not to find, but to locate. And I want to take you back to the beginning in Genesis, the first chapter, First verse. Now I told you to put your, your uh, I told you to turn to Mark. So if you want to turn to Genesis with me in the first chapter, first verse, you can. I'll put it up on the overhead. I say it's the hardest one to locate because there's so many pages on the other side of your Bible that when you try to turn to Genesis in the first chapter, you always get to those blank pages in the beginning of your Bible that I think are meant for notes. It's really hard to get to Genesis 1:1. But in order to understand what does speaking have to do with bringing life, we've got to go back to the beginning. We have to go back to the very beginning of all things. In Genesis, the first chapter and the first verse, there is no more beginning than this. It says, in the beginning. Here we are. We've, we made it, the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now listen to this, verse number three, this is what I want to talk to you about. What does speaking have to do with life? Look at this, verse number three. Then God said, there is speaking, the spoken word of God. Then God said, let there be light, there was light. Then God said, let there be the heavens, there's the heavens. And God said, let there be land on the earth. There's land on the earth. Then God said, let there be vegetation on the earth. Then there's vegetation on the earth. Then God said, let there be animals on the earth. Then there's animals on the earth. You see, speaking started with life. When God opens his mouth, life comes out, and all of a sudden, God takes nothing from nothing and makes something out of it. Now, you've always heard that term, God can take something from nothing and make something from it. But let me tell you something. God can take nothing from nothing, non-existence, emptiness, blank, zero matter, and he can make life come out of that through the words of his mouth. So life is in the power of the tongue. Yes, we see that clearly that is the right of God. Unarguably, when God speaks, 
life can come out of it. God made man out of dust. God put man to sleep, made woman out of a man's rib. I mean, come on. God can speak and life happens. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Romans that God is a God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God can take nothing from nothing and make it into something. So do our words, the question then being, we see that life is in the power of God's words, but the question now goes into, do our words carry that kind of a weight? The answer to you today is yes. Spiritually, they do. Jesus himself tells us about it. Now I had you turn to Mark, the 11th chapter. I hope you had a ribbon there. I hope, hope you kept your thumb there. Because now we come to Mark, the 11th chapter. Pastor Deborah used this verse this morning, and she was talking about this a little bit of show and tell <clears throat> with Jesus. As he was walking in Mark, the 11th chapter. Verse number 23. Jesus Christ is speaking to his disciples, and he says to them, For assuredly... I say unto you that whoever, listen to this, whoever says, whoever says to speak, to vocalize, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, goes on to say, but believes the things that he what? Says will be done. He will have whatever he says. There's a word there I want you to grab a hold of. If you haven't got a hold of what we're talking about, three times Jesus says to us about our speech. You speak to the mountain, you believe it'll move. Whatever you believe in your heart, whatever you say will be done. So let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that life and death are in the power of the tongue. We see that in the creation that God spoke and life came to existence. Now we see through Jesus Christ that our words carry a weight with us. We can choose in our lives to speak life, to speak the word of God, to speak a creation into, into existence in our walk with God spiritually, or we can choose to speak death, negativity, unbelief, disbelief in our life. You see, the decision is each and every one of ours. So today, talking about word of mouth, I want to talk to you about some of the things that when we speak, what we should say. Now, I want to say this. Now, it goes on to say, verse number 24, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. You see, we don't have just the authority to make things come into existence. Out of this verse... Pastor Deborah was talking about it this morning briefly. Out of this verse comes a teaching, a certain avenue of Christianity called the word of faith. Maybe you've heard some of the Christianese or the terms that have come out of that word of faith teaching. Uh, blab it and grab it. Name it and claim it. But out of this word, we have got to be mature in our understanding that there's more than just a, a catchy phrase more than just a title. And we can't take what some people have taken over centuries and over decades, and we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Some people have gone so far on one side of the ditch that they've turned off the people around them to the word of faith, to speaking the word of God. And then there are other people on the other side that just say, no, it's just, it, you know, you can go and claim whatever you want. But, you know, throughout the Bible, the teachers, Paul writes to the churches and he says, man, you should be mature, but I have to keep feeding you milk or spiritual baby food. And it's up to you and I to read the word of God, to get the word of God in our lives and to have a mature understanding of what Jesus Christ is saying. Is he physically talking about a mountain? Possibly, potentially, he could have been speaking about a mountain next to him. Now, does that mean that you and I can go speak to Mount San Gregorio? And look at it and say, Mount San Gregorio, be thou cast into the sea and it be done. <laughs> you know, the word of God tells us that if we believe in our heart, that it can, that it would be. The question is, is how much do we really believe that God has the ability to do so? Because here's where the mature understanding of that verse comes. We don't speak things because of our authority. 
You see, we don't do anything under our own power. When we speak the word of God, when we look to that mountain, maybe that mountain is something that you're facing. Maybe that mountain is an issue of your life, a sickness that you've been going through. Maybe that mountain is your job. When you speak to that mountain and say, get out of my way, you know, let me tell you something. With a mature understanding, you realize, listen, it's not about what you're saying. It's about the name that comes behind it. And it's about the authority that comes with that name. You see, you and I have authority, but it's only given to us through Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, in Matthew, the 18th chapter, as Jesus Christ is on his way ascending into heaven, Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses number 19 and 20, you and I know them as the Great Commission. Go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples. But what about verse number 18? Right before the Great Commission, Jesus Christ says in Matthew, the 18th chapter, in the 18th verse, go ahead and put it up. He said, Matthew 28, 18, excuse me. Jesus Christ says, all authority has been given to me. Me, capital M, speaking to Jesus. You see, you and I, we live in the authority of Jesus Christ, and we can speak with the authority of Jesus Christ, but we have got to have a mature understanding that when we speak, we carry the name of Jesus Christ. And if we use that name in vain, or if we use that name for our own profit, there become consequences from that. And that's where the mature understanding of the word of faith, of the spoken word, of speaking the word of God over your life, in your prayers, to your mountains, that's where the mature understanding comes from. Why? Because you and I have got to have an understanding that when we speak, you and I are incapable of doing anything on our own but the name of Jesus Christ, who the authority, because he came and he grabbed the keys of sin and death and took them from the devil, kicked the devil's butt when he rose from the dead, Jesus Christ now has the authority to do it. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the name above all names, the power above all powers, things that are named and things that are not even yet named. He is above it all. And it is with that name that we speak the word of God over our lives. When we open up our mouths, we proclaim things about our lives, we've got to understand that we have to have a mature an adult understanding. It doesn't matter if you're a new Christian or not. When you understand the severity of what's behind it, the reverence of what's behind it, then you have an understanding of what you can do and what you cannot do with it. So today I want to talk to you about your word of your mouth, the word of mouth. Jesus Christ tells us that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth before he leaves his disciples, he tells them in John the 14th chapter that they will do greater works than he because he goes to his Father. The Holy Spirit lives within us through the name of Jesus Christ. We have been given the authority so we can speak to our mouths. So today I want to talk to you about when we speak. I've got four things for you. I've got four things for you quickly tonight that I want to talk to you about when you speak. So if you're taking notes, just write when you speak and you can put a little colon or whatever. Number one today, when you speak, speak in faith. Speak in faith. You've got to believe what you say. You know, it's one thing to go about and say, wow, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. Oh, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed with heaven's best but not believe it in your heart that God is capable. Yeah. I was telling the men yesterday, when it comes to the, your issues, you can shake those issues, cigarettes, bottles, addictions, whatever it might be. You can shake them through the power of God. Yeah. The question is not whether you can or cannot. It's unquestionable in my mind and in my belief that through Jesus Christ, you and I can overcome. Why? Because Jesus Christ tells us that we are overcomers. The question is, do we believe God enough to allow him to come into our lives and do a work in us, or do we shut him out with our disbelief? You see, one of the best ways to be ineffective in your speaking with your relationship with God is to speak with disbelief in your heart. As a matter of fact, in Mark, the 11th chapter, we're there anyways. 
Mark, the 11th chapter, Jesus Christ says it. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Church, when God repeats himself, it's time for us to listen. And when we speak, Jesus Christ repeats himself twice over, right after each other, talking about facing that mountain in your life. And he says, when you speak to it, you speak to it in faith with the utmost belief that God himself is backing you. And it is not on your power when you're speaking to your finances. It's not your ability to get rich quick. When you're speaking about your kids, it's not how good of a parent you are. When you're speaking about your job, it's not about how good your boss is because those are things out of your control. But rather, how big is your God in that situation? You and I have got to speak in faith. First and foremost, we've got to believe that God is able. This is where maturity comes into play. You see, you can't just use the name of Jesus to get what you want. As a matter of fact, let me show it to you in the Bible. Turn with me to the book of Acts. Turn with me to the book of Acts in the 19th chapter. <laughs> Talking about a mature understanding of the power of God and God backing the belief. Acts in the 19th chapter. We're going to read in verse number 13. It says, Acts 19, 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish Exorcists. All right, hold on. I don't know if you've ever heard of that word itinerant. If, you, if you've ever grown up in church, you know what an itinerant minister is. There's somebody who goes from place to place. They preach. They don't have a church per se. They're not a pastor of a church. They go from place to place and they preach. So now we're talking about somebody who kind of wanders, gets paid to do something. They're itinerant exorcists. Okay. We'll call that in today's day and age, ghost hunters. It's all over the TV. They go through the house with all their equipment, and they try to chase the evil spirits out of the house so that somebody who lives in that house isn't haunted anymore, and they get paid X amount of money to do that. Some ghost hunters, itinerant ghost hunters. Some Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, listen to this, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. <clears throat> Not we exercise you in the name of Jesus, the name above all other names, the name who came and died on the cross so we could have it, the name who said that we could do greater things than he no. We exercise you in Jesus, whom Paul preaches. So they're saying, you demon, get out of them, because of there's, a, there's a guy named Jesus who a guy named Paul talks about that says you need to get out. <laughs> clearly, clearly we can see these men, these itinerant exorcisms, they didn't have faith. Right? Just by their verbiage. They had to reference Paul about Jesus. So it goes on to say, verse number 14, also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. Who did so. <clears throat> Listen to this, verse number 15. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. You see, it's not about what you say. It's 
It's about what you believe. It's not about what comes out of your mouth. It's not about the spoken word. Wow, I can say it, therefore I can have it. I can blab it and grab it. It's about what you believe. They tried to cast out demons in Jesus who Paul preached, not in Jesus who touched their lives. And they themselves were taken over by it. It's not about that. But let me show you something else. I'll just put it up on the overhead. In Acts, the third chapter, going back in time, two men who had lived with Jesus, who had walked with Jesus, were going to a, the temple called Beautiful. There was a lame man that asked them every day, he was lame from birth, that asked every day, that was dropped off every day to ask for alms as people went into the temple. These two men who were going into the temple were Peter and John. You know their names, disciples of Jesus Christ. As they're walking into the temple, the man asks them for alms. And they say, hey, look at me. And they get his attention. And then he looks at them. In Acts, the third chapter, it says, and Peter says, silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have, listen, listen to the faith behind what Peter just said. I don't have the money that you need. It's not about money. It's not about alms to make you better. I've got something better for you. And he says, it's not about money, but I'll give you something that I have, I possess, I own in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the next verse says, they grabbed him by the hand and lifted him up and he walked. You see, it's not about what you say. It's about what you believe. It's not about using Jesus' name to get something, but understanding that the name of Jesus comes behind you when you believe in him. To back you, and it is his authority, his ability, that comes and gets the job done. Wasn't Peter and John that raised the lame man up? It was Jesus Christ, the power, the authority that was given to him when he defeated death and sin. But now you and I can believe. And when we speak, speak it in faith, church. When you're speaking over your children, speak it in faith. When you're speaking over your finances, speak it in faith. When you're speaking over your healing, speak it in faith. Why? Because God is not small. God is not too small for your issue. God is not smaller than your mountain. God is not smaller than your kids' issues. God is bigger. And who are you going to rely on, your ability or God's ability? You and I have got to speak in faith. We're talking about the word of mouth. Acts, the third chapter, just a quick thought. I talked about Jesus saying, greater works would we do because he goes to the Father. Right there in Acts, the third chapter, is the fulfillment of what Jesus Christ was saying. Now all of a sudden, his disciples, who, in, who earlier and when Jesus was here couldn't cast out demons, now all of a sudden Jesus is gone and they're raising the lame and the dead. Why? Because now there's something that comes. They have a faith on them. We're talking about word of mouth. When you speak, number two, speak the word. Speak the word. You want to speak, Pastor Deborah was saying, a directed prayer, she was talking about that. A guided prayer is what we need to pray in order to be bold. How do we understand the will of God in our life? To understand the word of God in our life. You want to know what the will of God is? It's in the word of God. So when you and I speak the word, you speak the will. Did you get that? When we speak the word of God, and listen, listen. Remember I talked about maturity. All right, I talked about that. I'm not saying speak the word of God and twist it and read half a sentence and say, well, the, the Bible says these four words in a row, so that must therefore be the will of God in my life. But to read it in context and to understand what is being said and taught to you and I. But when we speak the word of God, we live the will of God in our lives. And you and I have got to speak the word audibly 
to say it out loud. Go with me in your Bibles to James in the fourth chapter. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to James in the fourth chapter. James in the fourth chapter. You okay with me tonight? Are we all right? James in the fourth chapter. Listen to this. Listen to this. Whew. James 4, chapter, verse number 3. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. You see, you and I have got to speak the word of God. Why? Because that aligns us with the will of God. And when we speak and pray the will of God, the guided prayer that Pastor Deborah talked about in this morning's message, the guided prayer aligns us with the will of God, which aligns us with the power of God, which aligns us with the promises of God, which gets things done. And James says you ask of God and you don't get it because you ask Amiss because you're asking for your own desires. We cannot just go before the Lord in the name of Jesus and expect that when we ask that we're going to get whatever we want, even though the Bible says, Jesus said, you can have whatever you ask. Remember, I was saying that. You can't take four words and just contort them because Jesus Christ wasn't saying, well, you can have whatever you ask for. Lord, I want a Lamborghini. God, I want a yellow Lamborghini. Gallardo. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Am I going to get that? You know, likely not. Here's why. Because I ask according to my own selfish desires. God is a God who is a father, a loving father. He knows that I'm stupid, and I'd probably take that $250,000 Italian sports car on Highway 38 and probably drive it off a cliff being stupid and die. Then again, maybe someday I'll get a Lamborghini Gallardo. <laughs> who knows? But we can't ask just because we think we get it, but rather what is according to the will of God in our lives. Amen. What is the will of God in your life? Yeah. Read the word of God. Yeah. Read the word of God and speak the word of God over your life. Listen to this, verse number 7 through 8, jumping down a couple verses. James is writing, therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Hey, James says, listen, you draw near to God, guess what? He'll draw near to you when you speak the word of God, and you speak the word of God and align it with the, go the will of God. You align it with the promises of God. You align it with the, pr the presence of God. Let me tell you something. God draws near to you, but he says something to the people. He says, wash your hands. Cleanse your minds, you double-minded. What does the Bible tell us about a double-minded man? That they're unstable in all of their ways. So when you and I speak something based off of our emotion, based off of what we think, rather than the word, we become double-minded men, unstable in all our ways. The very people that James was writing to that says, wash your hands, you double-minded. But when we cleanse ourselves of our own selfish ambition, when it says submit to God, that's the key to allow God now to be the leader, to now allow God to be in the driver's seat of our lives. Now all of a sudden the word of God is more important to me than what somebody says beside me. The word of God stands more, has more value to me than a doctor's prognosis. The word of God has more value to me than the stock market report. The word of God has more value to me than what Oprah Winfrey says about my kids or Dr. Phil says about my family. Why? Because I've submitted to God. And now, because I have submitted to God, I speak the word of God. And when I speak the word of God in my submission to God, I know that I have aligned myself with the promises of God, the blessings of God. And now I know that when I speak, life comes out. When I speak, things happen. Double-minded minded man is unstable. In all his ways. You have got to be, hey, you have got to be single-minded people in a, in a society and a time when we are supposed to be open-minded, open-minded and, 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 and to, 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 to allow tolerant of things. Hey, listen, I'm sorry, but you and I have got to be single-minded people, single-minded 
fixed upon the word of God. Not what an, an organization says, not what a committee says, but what does God himself say. And when we fix ourselves upon that, we speak the word of God. We have got to speak the word. We're talking about when you speak, number three. When you speak, speak to your mountain. Put in parentheses there, speak to your issue. You got to talk to it. Don't got to think at it. Don't want to just will it away in your head, in your mind. To speak to it. Jesus Christ in Mark. The 11th chapter, it didn't say, therefore, whoever thinks in his head about this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. If he believes in his heart, whatever he thinks he should have, he uses the word speak, vocalize, talk to it, quote the word. Remember, we just talked about it, speak the word. So what do you speak to your mountain? What do you speak to your problem? What do you speak to your enemy? The word. You speak the word to your problem. You speak the word to your enemy. You speak the word to your issue. That's what you and I have got to do. Speak the word. You call it out by name, vocally. Let's take an example. You know, Jesus, when he healed, he spoke to the people he healed. Just a few examples in Matthew, the eighth chapter, to the leper. Leper, he said, be thou clean, and the leopard was healed. Matthew, the chapter 8, the Roman centurion comes and says, all you have to do is say, my servant would be healed, and he will be healed. And guess what? He was healed. Yeah. Matthew, chapter 9, a man with palsy, Jesus said to him, take up your bed and walk, and he was healed. To the woman with the issue of blood who touched his garment, he said, your faith has made you whole. You know what? Jesus didn't just speak to the people he healed. He spoke to the demons too. Mark chapter 9, the epileptic boy fell into the fire. He rebuked the foul spirit. It didn't say that Jesus came and the father said, can you heal my son? And Jesus asked him, do you have faith? And he says, oh, Lord, yes. And Jesus thought, to his son, he rebuked him, said, you demon, get out in the name of Jesus. And let me tell you something, the boy was healed. Yeah, right. He spoke to the demon. Amen. He spoke to the foul spirits. In Matthew, the eighth chapter, he cast out the demons in the herd of pigs. And when they said, he asked them who they were, they said, please don't make us go. Let us go into the, the, the herd of pigs. Jesus said to them, go. And they went. The authority behind the name of Jesus. Hey, but he's not done. He didn't just, just speak to the demons. Hey, guess what? He spoke to the devil. Matthew, the fourth chapter, the devil tried to tempt Jesus. You know what Jesus answered to him? It is written. Let me tell you something, guys. The devil can't read your mind. The enemy doesn't read your mind, your thoughts. It might play off your emotions and your actions. If the devil could read your mind... He wouldn't have to speak to Jesus. They would have had an intellectual battle inside the mind, but rather the devil spoke to Jesus, and Jesus audibly spoke back to him. And you and I, when we pray over our sickness, we lay hands on ourselves, we think, I'm healed. Let me tell you something. you got to speak that you're healed you got to say that you're healed. Your finances are busted. you got to say something about it. And let me say to you who can't speak, if you can't audibly speak it, you sign it. But you make an effort to get it out there. Because let me tell you something, God is a God who is bigger than issues. But you speak to your mountain. Okay, but that's all Jesus. Jesus spoke to the issues. He calmed the storm, right? He rebuked the fig tree like we heard about. He raised Lazarus from the dead. That's a big issue. Okay, but that's all Jesus. What about, what about anybody else other than Jesus? Okay, Peter and John, we read about them in Acts, the third chapter, raised the lame man. How about Peter, who healed 
A, 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 Aeneas, forgive me for pronouncing that, in Acts 9 chapter. In Acts 9 chapter, he raised Tabitha from the dead. What did he do? The Bible tells us that he went over to her body, her corpse. And he said, Tabitha, arise. And she woke up. He spoke to the problem. Church, you and I have got to be vocal. You and I have got to be audible. You and I have got to say something to the mountain. Let me tell you why. Because when you speak, remember the Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. When you speak, life comes out. Now all of a sudden, you're held accountable for what just came out. How about this? Oh, I'm believing in the name of Jesus. You're going to be healed. I'm praying for that cancer in the name of Jesus. Somebody comes along and says, well, that person wasn't healed. But when you speak it out, now all of a sudden, you're on the hook. When you speak it out in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. In the name of Jesus, my finances are not the way they are. In the name of Jesus, my kids will grow up to serve God all the days of their life. In the name of Jesus. And you speak it out. Now all of a sudden, your faith is on the hook. And now all of a sudden, your faith is put to a test. And that's why, first and foremost, you've got to believe what you speak. Because as soon as you say something, power goes into action. Not your own, but the power of Jesus Christ. To speak to that mountain. To speak to that issue. You know, I remember I went on a missions trip to Peru. My wife and I went. And we were praying for people and we were with these evangelists. And it's amazing, the receptiveness of the healing of, uh, of, of Jesus Christ. And the, on the other side of the Andes, we were out in the rainforest of the Andes in Peru and South America. And we were with these evangelists and they were having crusades and they lived there all the time. They were praying for people and they had cataracts and tumors and all things. I mean, just everything you could think of, you could just see it. And as they were praying for it, you would see tumors just shrink. You would see cataracts just go and you'd see eyes clear up. And I remember we were praying one night in a city that we were facing great opposition in. And we were praying for people. They had a prayer line, and all of us who were on the mission trip were praying for people. And we were saying, in the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And the evangelist came over to us, and he said, stop. I said, what? He says, you know why you're not effective? No. We're just praying for God. He says, because you need to call it out by what it is, and you need to specify in the name of Jesus, you foul cataract, you demon, you get out in the name of Jesus. Cancer, you got no place in the name of Jesus. Tumor, you go. And, and we started praying with faith, speaking to the issue. Not to the general, but to the issue. And let me tell you something, with my own eyes, with my own eyes, I tell you, church, People's eyes, I could see them, they'd close their eyes with cataracts and they'd open them and they'd have green eyes. Their tumors on their necks would go to nothing because you speak to the mountain. You're going through something, you got a prognosis, your kids are going through something. Let me tell you something. You speak to the issue. You speak to the mountain. You speak to it and say you and you call it out audibly or you sign it. Whatever you got to do, you speak to it. You speak it in faith and you speak the word of God to it. Like Jesus responded to the devil. It is written, healing. By the stripes of Jesus Christ, I am healed. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. You speak the word of God in your life and you watch what God does for you. Can we do one more? I've already gone late. Is that all right? We're talking about when you speak, number four. This is my favorite one. Because this is where Christianity kind of gets weird if people watch you. Number four, you speak to yourself. When you're driving in the car, just tell somebody you got a Bluetooth chip. But you say it. When you read the Word of God, you know, there's times to read it silently. But then you know what? Let me tell you something, church. There's times that you've got to get up and you've got to read that word out loud. You speak it to yourself. Speak the word of God over yourself. One of my favorite things to do is apply the word of God in my prayer. Sometimes I don't know what to pray. Pray the word of God. Speak it to yourself. Watch what this says. Romans 10 chapter. Verse number 17 says this. When faith comes by hearing... Hearing by the word of God. Talks about having a preacher. Let me tell you something. You don't got to be in church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That's where it's good to get. And you get fed. But let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit can speak to you. You got to just speak it to yourself. You got to hear it. 
You got to hear it. You got to say to yourself, I am chosen. I am a new creation. Because let me tell you something. There are times you don't feel like it. But you are a new creation. Cleansed by the blood of the lamb. And you speak that over your life. God, I say, man, Lord, I don't know what to do at work. And you start to speak, Lord, your word says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. You remind yourself what the word of God says. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are spiritual. You speak those things. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. And you speak those things over your life. You remind those things of your life, and you get them into your system. Why? Because faith comes by hearing. Yes, yes, yes. And you don't always hear yourself when you think. you got to speak it. Speak it out loud. Speak it over yourself. Amen. Jesus, as he's speaking to the devil, is quoting Deuteronomy the 8th chapter, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, I'll just put it up on the overhead. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Speak the word of God to yourself. Speak it. You hear the TV all day long. You hear the bad news all day long. You hear music all day long. Church, what would it be like if we heard the word of God all day long? Hey, how about this? Coming from ourselves. People looking at you at the bus stop. That guy's talking to himself. <laughs> Praise God, I'm getting the word. Having a Pentecostal meeting. You're doing the Pentecostal jig. <laughs> because you're speaking the word. And it gets inside of you because faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Speak the word to yourself. Today we're talking about the word of mouth. You got to speak in faith. You got to speak the word. You got to speak to the issue. Last, you got to speak to yourself. Did you guys get something out of that today? Well, hey, listen, I want to do one more thing. I want to ask you a question. Just give me a moment more of your attention. Please don't get up. Please don't walk around. Not because I'm on a power trip, but because I want to get your attention. The Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. And when somebody gets up, when you get up, walk around, people look at your shoes. They look at your shirt. They lose focus on what they were just thinking about. Let the Holy Spirit minister to some of you in a moment. Just give me a moment more of your time. I want to ask you this question. If you were to leave this place today, and heaven forbid, by no fault of your own, you were to die, your heart were to stop beating, you were to drop dead. Would you find yourself in heaven? Would you find yourself in hell? Relatively simple question. Why don't you answer that within your heart? You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, to be honest with you, I'm not sure where I stand on heaven or hell. I'm not sure if I buy into that yet. Let me tell you something. Just because you may not believe that hell doesn't exist doesn't mean it's not real. You know, that's like saying I don't believe in semi-trucks, maybe because I've never seen one before, but I can go stand on the slow lane of the freeway. Lo and behold, I meet one face to face. Let me tell you something. Hell is a very real place. Heaven is a very real place. God thought it important enough to mention it in his word. Jesus Christ important enough to talk about it in his teachings. Therefore, it's important enough for you and I to take it serious. Believe in it. You don't see where the wind comes from, but you know it's there. Same thing. Well, you know, but Pastor Luke, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I hope so. Sure, sure want to get to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible will you find that because you think you're going to get to heaven, you'll get there or because you hope so? Most positive outlook on life because you have the most wishful thinking to get into heaven that God's going to look down upon you and say, well, he really wanted it bad enough, I'll give it to him. You know, you might say, well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I wasn't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu or a Muslim or any other type of world religion. So doesn't that mean by default, by classification, that I'm going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God we find that because you weren't raised in some other world religion, some other philosophical thought that you're going to get your way into heaven. Nowhere will you find that. Hey, did you know you can't get to heaven because you're a good person? Because you've never robbed a 7-Eleven or, or, or you, you don't cheat on your taxes? You've even given to charitable organizations? You know that in the Bible you'll find that. Nowhere does it say that because your good works, because you work hard enough, you're going to get into heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good words, good works, According to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing we could ever do on our own would ever get us into heaven. It's just not that way. 
Here I am. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth and quit playing games with you today. You know, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents took you to church, had you baptized or christened, because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school classes, you sat in church, you're here tonight, nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you did that, you're going to get yourself in heaven. Nowhere will you find that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you've memorized some scripture, because you carried the pastor's Bible, because you served in the youth ministry at your last church, whatever it might be, that you're going to get into heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. As a matter of fact, in the book of John, third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Nicodemus asks Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? Before I give you Jesus' answer, let me tell you a little bit about what the Bible tells us about Nicodemus. The Bible says that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. What does that mean? That means that in today's day and age, Nicodemus was like a PhD. He had dedicated his life to studying and to memorizing the scripture. Nicodemus taught in the temple. He gave to the poor. He wore all the right clothes. He did all the right things. He was a very good person, memorized scripture, could sing the scripture. And you would think that based on the outward appearance of Nicodemus, based on what Nicodemus had done with his life, Jesus, when Nicodemus asked him that question, Jesus would say to Nicodemus, hey, pat on the back and say, man, you keep on going. Great is your reward in heaven. But let me tell you something. Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You see, that's where it's at. God's after your heart, not your mental ascent. He's not after your carnal knowledge of him, your mental ascent towards him. God's after all of your heart. God's after all of your life. That's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. That's God's intent for the word born again to mean that you've given him all of your heart. You've given him all of your life. You see, with God, it's an all or nothing relationship. Again, let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, people like you and I, sitting in chairs, sitting in seats, doing good works, hearing the word of God. He says to them, I know your deeds. When I come back, what that means is when it comes time for you to meet him face to face. He says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Translation means to, to be cast out, rejected out of the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Lukewarm means this. It means you're floating around in your relationship with God. You're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out. Occasional, occasional commitment, token prayer here and again. Maybe you wear a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Give yourself the title of a Christian. Here's the bottom line. Lukewarm means that you're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're kind of right in the middle, right in the fence. And Jesus Christ said, hey, if that's you, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. Why? Because it's an all or nothing commitment to God. He wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. Why is that? Because he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, his everything for your salvation. In return, he wants your everything for heaven. Well, how do we get to heaven? You know, we can't get there your way, my way. Can't get there some author's way or well-meaning church committee's way. You know, the only way to get to heaven is through God, God's way. Jesus Christ says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, no man goes to the Father except through him. So you know what? Let's not try to get to heaven any other way. Let's do it God's way. What does that mean? Jesus Christ said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So here's what I'm going to do in just a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to smack my hand on the Bible on the third count. I'm going to go one, two, three. It's like that. If that's you in this place and you want to give your heart, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to make sure you're going to get into heaven, in a moment I'm going to ask you to be bold and pop your hand up so I can see it. We'll all do it all at the same time. You say, Pastor, look, if I put my hand up, I'm going to be embarrassed. I don't know if I can do that. The person I came with is going to know. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to embarrass you because you put your hand up. But even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? You see, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in or make his way in. You can't raise the hand of the person next to you. It's between you and God. So I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you are embarrassed because you put your hand up, let me tell you something. If you miss this opportunity and you find yourself in hell, you'd do anything you could to get out of hell. You'd raise anything you could to get out. So don't miss this opportunity today for a moment of embarrassment if that's you in this place. Who should raise their hand? If you've never given them all your heart, you've never given them all your life in a moment, let's make today the day you go forward for Jesus Christ and pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. 
Who should raise their hand if you're not sure? Think, man, maybe did I do this as a kid? You know, or maybe, I've ne maybe you've never made a public profession of your faith. Today, if that's you, if you're not sure, make sure. Hey, listen, the Bible says that you don't know what tomorrow holds. I'm sure each and every person in this room can relate somehow to somebody whose life was taken from them in an instant and they didn't know that they were going to go. Don't take that, a gam that gamble on your eternal lifestyle. It's a gamble you can't afford to make. Get sure, make sure today in just a moment when I count to three. Who should raise their hand finally? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, you've been riding the fence, you've been running from God instead of to God. If that's you in this place, in a moment, when I count to three, get your hand up. I'll count it, you can put it right back down. What you're doing by raising your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give... Jesus Christ, all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. You're acknowledged that you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. I'll count it. You can put it right back there. Nobody can make you do it between you and God. Today, let's make it the day you go forward for God. You get that authority, that power, that Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus that comes behind you like we talked about today. Let's get that in you today. If that's you, on the count of three, I'm going to count to three. If that's you, get your hand up. Be bold. Here we go. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands in the house today. One, two, three, I got you. Three wise people, anybody else? Four, I got you. In the family rooms, I see you guys, I see you guys, see, see Michael, you're pointing, where are you pointing at over on the other side? I got you, sister, I got you already. Four wise people. Five, okay, I see you over there. Five wise people, where are you at? You say, man, I wonder if I should. I see people pointing all over the place. You point, where are you point? Okay, I got you, sister, Six. six wise people. Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Hey, quit playing games with God today. Stop messing around with God and get your hand up so I can see it. Let's move forward for God today. Six wise people. Hey, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you if that's you. Get your hand up so I can see it. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Where are you at? You might even be saying, man, I wish this guy would shut up. I want to get out of here. Get your hand up. Quit messing around with God. I won't be offended. It's all right. Let's go forward for God if that's you in this place. Is that a hand over there? All right, seven. I got you. Anybody else? Seven wise people. Where are you at? Spirit of God speaking to you saying, you need to do this. You need to do this. Anybody else? I don't want to close it off, but I gotta, I'm going to close it off in a moment if that's you. Come on. Get your hands up. I know you're here. I'm pushing for you tonight. I'm pushing. There you go. Eight. I got you. Where are you at? I want to close this up, but the Spirit of the Lord's telling me there's more of you in this place. Where are you at? Nine. Where are you at, 10? Where are you at, 11? Where are you at, 12? Anybody else in the house today? Four more of you. Say, man, I wonder, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Come on. Put your hand up. Let me see it. We'll go forward for God if that's you. Anybody else in the place today? Well, praise God for nine wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I'm going to do. For those of you who raised your hand, and for the four of you that didn't raise your hand, you should have raised your hand, it's not too late. In a moment, we're going to sing a song together. Everybody's going to stand. If you didn't raise your hand, or if you did raise your hand, you said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart. You said him you were going to give him all your life. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You acknowledge that you want to get saved. I'm going to ask you to be bold. Grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, a purse, a friend. If you need a friend, if you came with somebody, say, come with me. I want you to bring them up. Get up out of your seat, get out of your chair when we all stand together and come meet me here at the altar. You said you were going to give him all your heart. You said you were going to give him all your life. Come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair and let us help you, let us pray with you today. If that's you, come on. You come from the back, from the family room, wherever you're at. Come on, come on. You can come, come on. From me Listen, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Today is a new day. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is like the nicest guy you'll ever meet, I promise. He's going to do a couple things with you. Don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. So he's going to take you right over there and he's going to lead you in a prayer real easy. You don't get saved by just a simple prayer. It's about the heart. It's about believing what you spoke today. 
So he's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free literature. A book that our senior pastors wrote. It's called Welcome to Your Destiny. Hey, I just got saved. What do I do now? Super easy reading. Help you get through so you don't go back to the stuff that you came from. He's going to invite you into a program that we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you see a personal trainer. Somebody helps you build muscles, get you strong. We got spiritual personal trainers, a friend. Somebody that will meet with you right before service, teach you some things about the Word of God. You buy a cup of coffee, whatever it is, for 15 minutes for five weeks. Teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong so you don't go back to the junk that you came from. And I want to ask one more thing. I know it's a lot to take in. One more thing. The spiritual personal training program is five weeks, but I want to ask you to commit to 12 months, one year, sitting under the Word of God in church here to get the Word of God. Listen, this is the place that you got saved. You say, I'm going to go back to my other church. Let me tell you something. If you were to die tonight at your other church, you would have been in hell because you didn't give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Sit in the Word of God for one year in this place, and I promise you, you'll look back on this day 365 days from now and say, wow, I can't believe how amazing God is in my life. So if you guys would just go right over here with Pastor Dave.